Hello, this is Simon Brew. I'm the editor of Film Stories magazine and a very warm welcome to a very special episode of the Film Stories podcast. Come with me. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. In movies, movies that have stories. And the story just sucks them in. This is just the beginning. Stories. We would be honoured if you would join us. Hello and a very warm welcome to Film Stories with Simon Brew. I am Simon Brew. As always, there's absolutely everything you need to know about me. The aim of the podcast, though, well, it's given away in the title. I am here to talk off the stories of films. And I tend to talk about production stories, marketing stories, release stories, editing stories, distribution stories, all the ingredients, really, that go towards making the films that we know and sometimes love. Just that, the films that we know and sometimes love. The films I tend to cover on this podcast lean more towards the mainstream than anything else. They're films I'm interested in or invested in to some degree. Try not to do snark. Try not to punch down. This podcast is an appreciation of cinema and and just me being thankful, really, that somehow films manage to get made. What you've happened upon here is one of my occasional special episodes of the podcast where I bring in a filmmaker to talk about their latest release or body of work. You get a little bit of both in this particular episode because I'm delighted to be joined for this film story special by David Eyre, the director of the brand new 2024 action movie, The Beekeeper. So that's where most of our conversation is centred. Now, spoiler, I really like The Beekeeper. Proper old school Jason Statham action films are right up my street. Jason Statham stars Emmy Raver Lampman, Josh Hutchison, Jeremy Irons, Jemmy, Gemma Redgrave, Mini, uh, Mini Driver, Felicia Rashad, Bobby Naderi. They're all in the ensemble for it as well. Kurt Wimmer has written the script for it and we talk quite a lot about the movie it's in uk cinemas or fire sky cinema on january the 12th 2024 so the day this podcast is being released we touch on a couple of other films that david air has been involved in i I talk fast and furious very very briefly but not directly i mentioned end of watch from 2012 we dance around 2016 suicide squad i didn't really want to go deeply into that because i think lots of people have already done that And we talk um, a a little bit about a screenwriter by the name of Wesley Strick as well. So I think that's all you need to know as the setup for this particular episode. What I'm going to do is I'm going to play you a clip from the trailer of The Beekeeper with no buzz jokes or anything like that at all. The other side of this, you'll hear my conversation with David Eyre. You're a blessing, Mr. Clay. This place was crabgrass and weeds and you brought it back to life. Mrs. Parker and I were friends. She was like family. She was the only person who ever took care of me. I just got a message saying that there's a problem with my computer. Yes, ma'am, we got this. Yesterday, she shot herself. This is private property. Do you know what they do here? Scamming the weakest in our society? Buddy, I'm counting to three. One, two, three. There, I did it for you. I'm going to burn this place to the ground. Will you stomp his ass out? That was a clip from The Beekeeper, and I'm absolutely delighted to say that its uh, its director, David Eyre, is joining me for a Film Story podcast special. Hello, David Eyre. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, it, it's a real pleasure. And I, I say from the off, I didn't think you were going to give me this film. I've been following the story. I'm a, an old school Jason Statham fan. And when I saw there was a film, Jason Statham, The Beekeeper, I mean, there's a movie out at the moment called The Bricklayer with Aaron Eckhart, an action movie. And what I understand, he doesn't lay any bricks in it at all. You've got Jason Statham actually keeping bees. You fully commit to this. I take it that was conditional on you taking the job on. I mean, pretty much. I didn't want to do CGBs (laughs) and, and we had to represent a little bit of beekeeping. And he properly learned the craft. He worked with a beekeeper. Really? He learned how to pull the comb, how to smoke the hive, uh, how to handle all the bees and, and harvest honey. And he does it for real. It's quite zen. <laughs> you are the only person in cinema history who's made an old school action film with proper beekeeping in it. I think it appears so, it's, yeah. I mean, it, beekeeping it, it, itself is fascinating and it's kind of this amazing metaphor that I think people have found rather resonant. 
Well, you do commit to it as well. I mean, all joking aside, I mean, your opening credits is a kaleidoscope of B, of B information. That again, I wasn't quite expecting this. I thought it was a bit going to be a bit Ben Affleck in The Accountant or something, where he doesn't spend an hour with Microsoft Excel. I mean, it, you, you you seem to care about the detail of it. Absolutely, and and it's also a little bit of world building and mythology. Yeah, and yeah. when you look at um, you know the roots of beekeeping, and I, I think um, Jeremy Irons says it in the movie is you know without beekeepers there'd be no bees, without bees there'd be no agriculture, no agriculture, no civilization. So it's really the foundational job of everything that surrounds us. It is still an absolute joy when St- Statham just looks at the camera and just says, "I keep bees, though." <laughs> In the midst of all of that. <laughs> it, it, it works. And you believe him because does, he actually, yeah. he can do it. He can keep bees. And I think the, the first day with him was when we shot a lot of the beekeeping material. And, you know, the, the crew was a bit surprised to see how committed Jason was and how dedicated he was to the process and how serious he took it. And, and you could feel it. You can feel it on the film. You can feel that he did connect with it. Yeah. Well, he connects with lots of people in the mm. film physically as yes, well. Yes, I mean, yes. I, I, I mean, I will come to that shortly. But can I ask about your entry point here? Because as I understand it, this was a, well, I was following it for a while. And you this was a moving project before you came aboard. And I think you had four months, uh, if I've got the timing right, between you coming aboard and production starting. So can you just take us into how you got involved and how you spent that four months? Absolutely. I got the uh, script from... Um, from Miramax and it, you know, as a director, you look for a few things and one of them is, you know, character obviously, and then structure. And there's this amazing uh, plot structure and Kurt's script that kept compounding and compounding. You know, you get a script and you have certain expectations. It's going to be this. And it blew through all my expectations and combined that with sort of the beekeeping mythology and this, this, world building that was present and it was it was an easy yes and then someone fired the starter pistol and then so begins sort of the the trials of preparing to actually make a movie and and i think that's one of the more mysterious processes for um the film viewer because it's so intense it's so logistics based it's it's like like a military operation Oh, it's why I asked the question, to be honest. Lots of people ask about the filming. Few people ask about the preparation and the editing of it, which, which which seem utterly crucial from where I sit. But in that four-month period, I mean, do you look to put a, a, a footprint on it, if you will? I understand you didn't change Kurt's script much, although evolved, obviously, as you're making it. But what were the things, what were the touch points you were looking to put in in that period of preparation? Well, the film... Uh, in the film world, it takes place in Boston. So a lot of it was finding locations in, here in the UK that yes, quite. that we could cheat for Boston. And then it's it's really logistics. It's it's getting in and out of locations. It's looking at places. Where am I going to put the camera? How are we going to get cables in here? Um, is the building manager going to get upset because the lights are hot? It's 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 a million little details. The the best way I describe it is you're firing a thousand arrows, you know, a month out to hit the target simultaneously. And it's, I think movie movies are made in prep and movies are made in post and everyone emphasizes the photography because in a way that's sort of the fun, obvious part. But if you don't have the assets in front of the camera, if you don't have a plan and especially with this much action, I mean, there's, there's an insane amount of action and all that has to be staged, choreographed. There's rigging. There's there's endless, endless detail. And I'm a bit of a process geek. So I've always yeah. gotten into the weeds of that and always found great satisfaction in that. And that's the, I mean, the way you're talking about that, it really sounds like that's a fun bit for you, just just the early building blocks. It. I, it, it's a little bit of love hate because um, <laughs> it's there's a lot of meetings, a lot of budget meetings, a lot of getting yelled at because there's no money, uh, and then figuring it out. And, and always like in filmmaking, um, there has to be some tension in the process. I think if if a filmmaker yeah. has you know just rampant freedom, you you don't. It's like the hammer and the sword and the anvil. You know you have to sharpen yeah. the sword with the blows. <laughs> and, uh, and you get beat up enough in prep, and then hopefully you're sharp enough to make a good movie. Were you actively looking for something you'd not written yourself? Was it just kind of, this just happened to cross your desk? 
it, it pretty much happened across my desk. You know, I'm always writing. I'm always trying to figure something yeah. out. I have, um, you know, a 10-foot stack of terrible scripts. Uh, so it, it is a bit of relief when someone's um, cracked the, the heavy lifting for you. Yeah. And, and so you, you get hold of a screenplay and you said before you read lots of scripts and you know where they're going. But there was something here that clicked. But presumably there's got to be a click with the people behind the project as well. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's, you know, life is short and you want to work yeah. with with fun colleagues, with people that share your vision and share sort of your methodology. And, you know, I'm very hands on. I've always been, um, you know, operating camera, always on set. Um, you know, standing there in the rain and the mud with the crew at 3 a.m. Uh, you know, I've always really enjoyed that collective part of filmmaking. And yeah, and, and it's a cliche and all that, but you really do become a family. And that that sort of um almost subliminal connection you get deep into a project where everyone has has an instinctual sense of what they're doing and what's needed. Uh th- there's really nothing like it. But, um, Jason Statham, I, I I was watching films like Safe and Blitz and The One before he got before he became Hollywood. Jason Statham, uh, and he was Britain's Jason Statham. We had him, we kept him for yes. a little bit. And and uh, as much as he's enjoyed a lot of success, he's moved a little bit away from that in recent times. And I'm always taken with. I think it was on one of the Fast and Furious films there, and and I mean it's it's almost like a state of action cinema that the story came out, there was a contract as to who could hit who, how many times, and it was mandated to that level of degree, which to me is just like not pure action at all. Here, you got him back fully on pure action. And again, was that there from the start? Was that something he was keen to do? Was it something you were keen to emphasise? I think a lot of it has to do with with the nature of the project and yeah. also just trusting the filmmaker and you know, we really developed an amazing relationship. And it, it's funny because I bring my A game to set every time. And I learned from Jason that in the action space, there's actually an A plus game. Yeah, and he I has, say that. Yeah. He has this um, encyclopedic knowledge of, of the action genre. He can tell you pretty much any punch ever thrown in cinema on any, any movie. And he knows the players, the stunt coordinators, the choreographers. He has such an awareness of uh, body motion and kinetics, and then he combl- combine that with his athleticism, uh, his his history as a martial artist, as a fighter, yeah. and that he does his own stunts. And normally, when you're blocking and developing action, you're always trying to protect the fact that it's not the actor. And so in this case, I was able to line up shots and really capitalize on seeing his face and connecting to the to the action and putting him inside the action. So that that was an amazing pleasure. I mean, it helps he can act as well, doesn't it? The, yes. I, I remember it was it was David Fincher, I think, who recommended Jason Statham as an actor to Stephen Knight for the film that became Hummingbird. And and you know, Fincher saw something in it. You clearly see something in it as an actor to hold the character together. Can you talk about that just a little? Absolutely. It, it's it's interesting because um you know, he's such an icon and such an action icon, and you know, he's always very stoic. And when you get to know him, he's very kind, he's he's very quiet, he has this dry, subtle humor. Um, you know, off duty, he's just a very normal person person. He's very not Hollywood. And in, in learning this about him, you know, it became clear that I could, I could get that on the screen and really open him up emotionally to the audience. And, yeah. you know, in Beekeeper, it's a bit of a slow boil. You know, it starts out very austere and simple, but emotional with some emotional depths. So by the time he yeah. starts laying waste to the enemy, uh, <laughs> we've, we've had a glimpse of his heart. I, I mean, I'm going very spoiler light, but I do want to talk about just that opening because, again, in modern action cinema, finding a, an antagonist who's doing things that you can instantly hate <laughs> is quite difficult, I think. And I, I think I can say that you you come up with cyber criminals who are targeting the elderly and robbing them of their money. I think I can safely say that. I'm amazed no one's got to that before but also the fun you seem to have with it 
the pacing of those sequences. I mean, it's really quite tense stuff, isn't it? Can you talk about finding that? And also, I mean, the edit of it, of, of how to restrict the pace of that opening against where we're going. Well, it was it was interesting because um, I guess Kurt, Kurt Wimmer had a family member who had been taken by one yeah. of these scammers. And, and, you know, as writers, I think we always project our internal world out into reality. And and, and that became the beekeeper. And there's always this interesting procedural component to how these scams unfold. And then as I researched it, it was a multi-billion dollar industry. And yeah. they really do prey on people with good hearts. They prey on people that don't have, you know, the hard cynical shell. They prey on trust, mm. which is, is ruthless. And you're always struggling in film to have a despicable bad guy. The worse the yeah, bad guy, the greater I'm, the hero. I'm not being glib about that either. Yeah. I mean, it's instantly. I hate them. Yes, and 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 it's 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 kind of a gift because it's so hard to find that in a movie and to create that in a movie, yeah. and and not have it feel mustache twirly. Um, and so I'm rather proud at how despicable they come across <laughs> they're vile i mean I, I love top gun maverick but i've got no idea who they're fighting in that right case, yes to say it's just like I, I yeah i mean i've been rung up by these people i do have to admire the fact that in the high-tech call center you take us to you just leave one or two corded phones in amongst all the headsets <laughs> um clearly for action movie purposes but that that's someone who loves their action cinema leaving stuff like that in absolutely i mean you know, it's interesting because the action language of the beekeeper, it's not a tactical firearms movie. And the guns are really just temporary tools that Jason will use as needed versus relying upon them. He he relies upon the fruits of the environment to wreak vengeance. <laughs> and it did come down to, um, should it be a phone? Should it be a stapler? He could use the wastebasket. Oh, let's use a computer in this moment. So it, it was kind of fun to come up with um, terrible ways to use common objects. Well, you use the F word there. And I, I mean, films such as End of Watch, films such as Fury, the, the stuff that you've written and poured your heart into before, this feels like a tonal shift to me. This feels like you having an absolute blast um, and, and really getting into the spirit of it a lot as well. Is that how it was for you? Is my assumption wrong there? It's it's correct. And, you know, it was an interesting exercise for me because traditionally my films are much more um, intense, dramatic, yeah. a little bit dark. Um, and I wanted to make a movie like the films that got me interested in filmmaking. So like, you know, Dick Donner's Lethal Weapon or Walter Hill's yeah, yeah. 48 Hours or Beverly Hills Cop or um, all those action greats, Die Hard. Um, you know, these are the directors I studied. And when you analyze these movies, they, they do have these moments of fantastical action, but there's this grounded quality to the characters and the characters can be quite fun, but also have a little bit of pathos. And so honestly, I didn't know if I was going to be able to pull off this, this, this tone. And yeah. it, it was, it was scary in the beginning. And as I moved through and learned to trust myself in this space, I got, I got more confident at it. And I just, I feel like, you know, there's a lot going on in the world today. And what yeah. we're missing is that movie magic, the escapism, the, the let's go to the cinema, let's forget our problems and really enjoy ourselves and then come out of it satisfied. You talk about the tone there. I wonder if this started to open up or scratch a comedy itch for you, because you talk about some of those action films there. And one of the things they all have in common is actual supporting characters uh, who you want to see on screen. And, and I, I think, again, I think they're a little bit lost now, but you've got this double act in here of Bobby Nadiri yes. and Emmy raver Lamp. Yes. And the, 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 I always think the test of supporting characters is crikey. I'd love to spend two hours in their company as well. And what they're putting on screen, I don't want to spoil it because I just think we've not seen supporting characters in action movies done this well for quite a while oh, wow. in films, it feels to me. So uh, can you talk about the casting of them, the onset of that, and then the editing, how much you leave uh, uh, on the cutting room floor of them to just keep us wanting a bit more of them? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was that was key for me because, um, 
you know, it's part of that tonality. And when yeah. you look at Emmy's role in the film, she's she's really the moral center and sort of represents, you know, the institutions and the institutions yeah. that are, are kind of struggling to, you know, police reality these days. And, you know, you immediately sense as a person with a good heart and a sense of purpose and mission and to counterbalance a little bit of a gravitas, uh, Bobby Nadiri, who's, who's just an amazing character actor. And I love Bobby because he has this, this everyman kind of world weary quality, but he's still optimistic about life and a little bit hopeful. And so uh, finding the right balance, the amount of humor, the amount of B puns, there, there's a lot more B puns that, that didn't I make it in the you. movie. I, yes. I, I've written no B puns in the review because there's no point. <laughs> you put them all in the film. You, <laughs> They're you all in the film. my work. Yeah, but it's it's no, I, I, it's the balance. It's finding the balance, and 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 I, th I think you're right in that you you want to leave the audience a, a little bit hungry and not yeah. quite fill them. I I, I mean, I, in days of old, we'd have had a DVD release of this with deleted scenes as well. So when you say you've left a lot of B puns behind, I mean, I, I, I it's it's quite a lot judging by the look on your face <laughs> as you say that. <laughs> It, it was, uh, it, it was, uh, we, we definitely treaded on, um, the dangerous waters of dad humor. Definitely. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm all for that. I'm all for that. But it's, it's small. Uh, one of the things I think comedy does in an action movie though, it's like you get to the end of aliens, you get to the end of Con Air, you get to the end of Die Hard and you know more than two characters. And often it's the humor that's kind of brought them up. A little bit. And again, I would, going back to when you first got hold of that script, how much was there? How much was in place of that? There, there, there was a lot there. And, and I think what working from Kurt's script enabled in me was, you know, I, I, I can be, you know, I can be a rather serious person and take myself, yeah. you know, maybe a little too seriously. And, <clears throat> and so to have this script with a hardwired irreverence in it gave me permission to kind of push myself further into the humor, into the fun than I normally That's do. That's interesting. Well, I mean, was is that the kind of thing in your filmmaking where you feel you need to be given permission? You know, just within yourself. I, I think so because, um, you know, because of my background and how I grew up, yeah. and 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 you know, the military yeah, and you know, the streets of Los Angeles and all these very sort of grim, serious environments. Um, and, and again, I'm a process geek. I'm very procedural and I'm always, you know, erring on the side of reality. So to have someone who can, you know, throw the fun grenade in the room for me, it was actually very useful because then I adopt that to my tone and tenor and yeah. it ended up being a really good alchemy. I, I'm kind of wary of asking too much more about the film directly because I, I just, I, I mean, I, if you can't tell, I had so much fun with this. I've been waiting for Jason Statham to do a film like this again for ages. I didn't know it was going to have bees in it. So I'm very, very happy about that. So can I just ask you about Wesley Strick? Oh, of there? course. Because yeah. I, I, I read the letter that you put out um in 2021 about, yes. about your background about the way your career changed and there's one line in there that i think mo a lot of people have missed about wesley Str wesley Strick, brilliant screenwriter of course um but you didn't really explain in that letter how he changed your life what how he it's almost like you give the impression that he saw your writing and believed in you but how did he see your writing if you weren't in that world at all why was wesley Strick so important to you <laughs> I was I was a builder, and yeah, uh, he a had, bricklayer. You should be. There's an action film about that. <laughs> I was an electrician and a house painter, and uh, <laughs> that's a box set. I uh, was renovating a, a home he had purchased. Met him, and you know he's just this nice, laconic, smart person. And I was fresh out of the navy, and uh, I, I told him some sea stories and you know, hinted that I had, I had written some things down and he wanted to see it. And, That's um, extraordinary. yeah. So I, I had a couple sea stories I'd written about my experiences. as I was trying to process, you know, everything that had happened there. And he's like, wow, you have a, you have a, a great sense of character and an ear for dialogue and which meant nothing to me, but he encouraged me to write a script and I became friends with the family and actually lived in his guest house while I typed out on a typewriter my first screenplay. 
which, you know, it was a little turgid and, and not that great, but it, there's some people recognized in the execution that I had some kind of talent that I myself had no idea I had. So it got me yeah. meetings and more encouragement to keep writing. And I just kind of kept at it. And, uh, you know, having that military discipline and mindset from yeah. the submarine force, uh, I just kept at it, got incredibly discouraged because I was trying to write what I thought the industry wanted. And then, so I just wrote one for me about the truth of the world that I had seen. And I wrote training day. It's extraordinary. I mean, just, just to acknowledge the generosity of the man at it, that point, it, just, just to take the time to read your words. He, I mean, no disrespect to you, but change changed my life. That, it's it's at my greatest ap- aspiration at the time was to have uh, an electrical contract company and own a truck. <laughs> I mean, that was okay. the sum total okay. of my aspirations. So ending up in this life, you know, thanks to Wes, was just extraordinary. That that I mean, I, that, I'm amazed no one asks you about that. I just think that's it. <laughs> so who paints your house now? Does the person who come and paints your house, if they say they're a writer, are you are you looking actively looking for people? I, if I say that, actually, people will flood your way. Let me rephrase. <laughs> but, you know, but but is that the thing? Are your eyes open? Does it open when, once you've been through that experience yourself? Does it give you an appreciation that talent doesn't necessarily come through a narrow funnel? Uh, absolutely. It's it's um. You know, it, it's not where you come from. It's really about where you can get to. And, you know, because yeah. of where I grew up and, and how I grew up, you know, I, I found that I've, I've been an inspiration to a lot of people um, who may not otherwise have access to the business. You know, and I'll be honest, at the time, um, a lot of people who enter in the film business, they come from backgrounds of wealth and privilege. And so yeah. you're you're taking basically entry fil- entry level jobs in the film industry, but you have to have a car, uh, a house, you have to have the clothes, yeah, you yeah. have to have the money to spend on the drinks and the socialization. And, you know, for people from low income, you know, or disadvantaged backgrounds, they don't have the resources to hit that on-ramp yeah. like other people do. So, you know, I am always you know, trying to encourage people to give it a shot. I'm terrible at painting houses, so I can't <laughs> come and do yours, I'm afraid. I, I, I don't mind if you don't want to answer this. Um, so I, I, I'm genuinely not trying to trip you up, which is a terrible setup for a question. <laughs> but can, can I ask about this part of the process, about talking to someone like me about a film? Because there's films I'm not asking you about that I think everyone else will do. <laughs> but you, you I, I mean, you've been bruised by a process whereby you could talk to me for an hour Mm-hmm. And just put in one sentence about something, and it won't affect my life in the slightest. But someone will rip that one sentence out of context, and then that's it. That's the whole, all the nuance of our conversation is gone. How do you feel about this part of it? Because I, I don't think anyone really asks filmmakers this about facing someone and talking about the film, wary of you know the interpretation is not in either of our hands. Yeah, it's interesting because um, you know, there's a research study done that positive information has one tenth the impact in our minds of negative information, which is why we have this thing called the internet. uh, And it's been so successful and and so sort of changing. Um, You know, over the years, I've learned, you know, you get media trained and and you sort of learn the pitfalls. Uh, The biggest trick is when you get answered a gotcha question, it's just answer the question you wish they asked. (laughs) Um, Yeah. But it, it's, um, you know, I've gone through several cycles of having the world media gang up on me in pretty awful ways. Yeah, I've spotted this. I've spotted this. And, and it's, um, it's, it's interesting because the person they're depicting is not who I am. And what they represent me as couldn't be further from my ethics, my my morality, what I represent, how I see the world. Um, it's 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 quite awful. I've actually made peace with that. Um, yeah. But I just you know I charge forward as a filmmaker. I want to share my work with people, and it, it, there there's there's a point. And not anymore, because once you go through it a few times, you kind of get used to it. Mm. Uh, Initially, it was absolutely terrifying. I remember um, 
uh, you know, when the reviews, when the embargo lifted on Suicide Squad, I was with my family in a restaurant. It was breakfast. I'm on uh, Twitter and I'm just watching this vitriol, personal yeah. attacks, personal attacks. I'd never seen such incredibly personal attacks against a filmmaker like that. And it just, it left me reeling. It, it left me yeah. wounded and confused and, and really started um, this interesting journey personally as, you know, I, who am I? Why am I here? What am I doing? What am I about? And why is this happening? And I think it's just part of, um, you know, when you put art in the world, you invite that conversation, you invite the criticism, you invite the feedback. Um, so, so it is part of it, but it's, it, it's, it is brutal. It is brutal. Yeah. And so just that, it, I, I mean, let me be the person who doesn't ask about that film then. And then said, you, you said it's given you a greater understanding of who you are and people are, weren't interested in who you were. So who are you? I mean, it's a really simple question, but, you know, it seems a good place to end. At the end of all of this, having made a really fun action film with a lot more bees in it than I've seen on screen in a long time, who who would you say you are? I'm, I'm not one thing, you know, I'm, I'm complex. Yeah, yeah. I'm, you know, it's, it's something you can't summarize. And I think the world will reflect, you know, reflect, reflects that back to me. Um, I've always honestly struggled with identity, you know, uh, yeah. you know, I grew up, you know, in, in the barrio. I grew up in, in, in a very violent, very intense neighborhood and, and saw a lot of violence growing up. And then I went to the military and did astoundingly intense things in, in the military and the cold war and the submarines. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. and, and so I've seen the world and and I'm still trying to process and understand a lot of that and those are the themes that recur in my art. So I mean at the core a lot of this is just a conversation with myself and and I think the question of who am I is is representative in in my film work except for one very specific movie which is no, not understand. my voice. <laughs> Well, I mean, if I if I can finish by saying, I'd genuinely be fascinated to see what a David Ayer comedy looks like because I, I, it's the one genre I just don't think you've gone near. No, uh, not near particularly, but it, it's scattered throughout your films. And well, I that's, just wonder if you've got the confidence to make a comedy. It's it's comedy is the most difficult to execute, and yeah. I would love to do a comedy. I, I really would, in, in all seriousness. And it is something I've thought about. Yeah. And then just to blow the doors off the conversation, I want to do a musical. I'm, yeah, do that. I'm fascinated by, by performance. I'm fascinated by human performance. I love going to theater. I love live theater. I love that, that bravery to put yourself in front of an audience yeah. and, and the technical skill. And I always call um, you know, uh, theatrical artists triple threats because you know they can they can dance they yeah. can they can sing and they can act and and there's something so ancient and primal about that and then how do you how do you bring that in person quality to a film so it's it's as a filmmaker I'm realizing I don't want to be cornered in any one lane yeah well, David Ayer, this has been a real delight, and I'm thrilled I asked you about everything but the film that everyone else seems to be asking you about, because <laughs> you've given me some terrific stuff there. And also, The Beekeeper, so much fun. Thank you so much. Quality knitwear, and I hope we get to chat again. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you so much. Thank you. And that was my conversation with David Ayer for The Beekeeper, which is available on January the 12th, 2024, the day that this has been released via Sky Cinema. It also marks the end of this latest episode of Film Stories too. So thank you for listening and thank you for your time. I've got lots more specials with filmmakers on the way. I'm delighted with some of the names we've been able to bring in. And I really, really enjoyed talking to David Ayer too. Hopefully that comes across in the recording. If I've not bored you, you can find more from me on Twitter at Simon Brew. I'm on Blue Sky at Simon Brew as well. Film Stories is there at Film Stories. Uh, we're at Facebook, facebook.com slash filmstoriesonline. Filmstories.co.uk is our website with news, reviews, 
reviews, features, all sorts there. If you go to store.filmstories.co.uk, that's where you can find Film Stories magazines for sale. Lots of them as well. We're really, really committed to print magazine publishing. And I think, well, we're currently doing the UK's biggest film magazine and also the UK's only regular film magazine for young film fans. So again, really proud of those. If you like this podcast and want to support it financially, if you head to patreon.com slash Simon Brew, you can do so there. But I think I've taken enough of your time. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. I will be back soon with your regular episode of Film Stories. Until then, you will look after yourselves and bye bye.